Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Welcome, everybody. Today, Lori and I are so excited because we have our CEO of Baltimore City Schools, Dr. Sonia Santolisis, here with us today. Lori, aren't you excited? I cannot wait to talk to her. Um, for all the listeners out there, my voice is a bit scratchy, but we are going to let Dr. <laughs> S talk for the majority of time today, so I promise you won't have to listen to me a lot. Um, but we've been waiting for this day for a very long time. Um, we are just super fans of her and of Baltimore. And so, Dr. S, welcome to the podcast. Thank you guys for having me. It's a, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here, I have to say. Thank you. So if well, you wouldn't mind, Dr. St. Louis, just taking a minute to introduce yourself to our audience. We know all about you, but let them know a little <laughs> bit about yourself. <laughs> sure, sure. So I am um, the CEO of Baltimore City Public Schools, and I think one of the greatest jobs anybody could ask for. Uh, previously, I worked with the Education Trust in Washington, D.C., which is an advocacy organization um, that really presses for uh, better educational opportunity and outcomes for uh, students of color as well as low-income students. And then prior to that, my first entry in Baltimore City was as Chief Academic Officer. So um, now my, my family and I, I think we are a full decade in Baltimore, which in Baltimore terms isn't all that much, but for us it's a big deal. I'm the mom <laughs> of uh, three daughters, and uh, my husband, who's not in education, uh, still is very supportive of the work that we're doing. So that's a little bit about me. Excellent. And we've been in Baltimore about the same time, so that's exciting. <laughs> oh, really? See? Yeah. Good, good things happened 10 years ago, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we could probably talk to you about a million different things and have hours of podcast time with you, but we really wanted to focus in today on um, Baltimore recently adopted Wit and Wisdom as their literacy curriculum, as you know. Um, and we know that there's a clear focus on literacy here in Baltimore City Schools and we're one of the first large urban districts to adopt a curriculum that's you know, an aligned curricula that's out there using ed reports, um, having a formal review process. So we wanted to talk with you just a little bit about that. So why did literacy become a priority for you as CEO as you came in um, and specifically adopting a curriculum? Why was that something that was at the forefront of your decisions to make? Sure. So uh, with regards to literacy, uh, one of the things that became very clear in re-entering Baltimore City Public Schools this time as CEO was that our city and our schools were in a place where real emphasis on uh, the ability to communicate orally, um, ideas, justification for ideas, um, a lot of you know, young people wanting to impact their world as I moved in conversations with them, uh, feeling as if they wanted to impact policies and laws, and it become very, becoming very evident very quickly that to do all of that um, and to advocate across multiple audiences, um, you really have to have a command of literacy, right? And mm -hmm. the gap between what our young people knew experientially and what they were able to translate in, um, in academic language was, was vast and through no fault of their own um, really was a, was a wake-up call um, as a school district for me. The data bore that out. Um, the shift to higher college and career ready uh, level literacy um, we had not made, which was evident in some of our student achievement data. And then I think most importantly, the realization that I was walking around talking to young people and families who were saying things like, oh, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be a lawyer, or I want to advocate for this, or, you know, I want to, you know, dig more deeply into, um, you know, environmental issues or financial issues, and realizing that the backbone 
for all of that has not changed in education. And if you are an individual who cannot read well and write well, um, that large portions of um, society's opportunities are going to be closed off for you. And schools are still the primary organization and institution that are charged with making sure young people know how to read. Now, when family and community get on board, um, you know, uh, religious organizations, civic organizations, that's all wonderful, but still it fits squarely in the responsibility of schools. And so that made it, frankly, fairly evident and obvious for me that we needed a deep dive uh, within city schools around literacy. I think the the shift with regards to focusing on curriculum um, really came at a time, and we just happened to be making, you know, the decision as, thankfully, the nation started looking at it. But a lot of it, mm -hmm. to be honest with you guys, really came from conversations with teachers and early mm -hmm. Um, visits to classrooms in the city. It wasn't because of bands of national research I had, uh, mm. you know, I had read initially. A lot of it was because when I, when I walked back in classrooms and asked teachers why they were teaching what they were <laughs> teaching, they were like, well, this is kind of what's here. They didn't feel all that hot about it. Um, and the fact that, you know, I left as chief academic officer at the very kind of onset of a shift in standards, knowing that the curriculum materials that were in place as well as the curriculum were really in transition mode. And when I came back three and a half years later and I'm like, wait a minute, we never transitioned out of transitional mm -hmm. curriculum materials? Um, I yeah. got to tell you guys, it, it freaked me out a little bit. Um, and, and then talking to, you know, teachers who were like, could we just get, you know, a great starting place uh, to begin. And, you know, I, I, I think there's something wrong if teachers are telling me they are spending 20, 30, 40 additional hours a week or a month um, trying to write their own stuff. And I thought, that's just madness. Like, we should not, we, no wonder we're burning people out. Like, you should not have to, in addition to everything else that comes with teaching, also be designing your own curriculum and then hoping it's standards align. So it yeah. really was a combination of, of things early on that pointed to um, curriculum as being important. And what you teach matters. And I have always believed that. It's been borne out in the data um, and in a lot of the research that mm -hmm. content matters, what you're learning, what you're teaching. Um, particularly in the area of literacy matters. Yeah. I don't think, um, I don't know if you were there, Melissa, but I saw, uh, or I was there, Dr. S., when you did a speech um, at a CIO Academy, and it was at the onset of when we adopted Wit and Wisdom. Yeah, and yeah. you just were, I, I wanted to like run up and hug you because you were, <laughs> you, I, I remember what you said. You were like, we have this, you know, standards aligned curriculum. We are not advocating using Pinterest. We are not advocating using Google. We are not advocating using teachers pay teachers. Like we are using this and you made it very clear. And mm -hmm. I think because of that clarity um, in terms of really, you know, being the vision of or setting that vision of we are doing this and we are all in. Like when I was um, in my position that year, I felt the most effective that I had in any year that I had done that job five years prior mm. because mm. when I went from building to building, the expectation was set, folks were using curriculum, and I could speak the same language in every single school with every single teacher. Like it was, it really did provide equity in terms of our students, but mm. also in terms of our adults, which was yeah. the very first time that had happened. And so I never thanked you because you didn't know I was super fanning it in the audience when you were saying that. But, you know, I, in hindsight, when I, I thought back about some reasons why that happened that year and it just was paramount that you said that, um, would you, I mean, if you can take us back there to that moment, like what were you thinking in terms of launching into a new um, curriculum really before the national lens 
lent itself to, you know, being really public because um, I feel like Baltimore was ahead of the curve in that resp- respect. Yeah, I, you know, and again, I, I probably, you know, have had my thinking influenced by a lot of folks. So I'm not going to take credit for being, you know, ahead of the curve. We have a way, a long ways to go. But I, I will say this, that I think <clears throat> we had become as a field, right, of educators, um, almost too wishy-washy in having a point of view, right, and asserting um, that no profession, no profession is expected, is it expected for people in and of themselves to come up with everything. And so it was a way to give permission um, to teachers to say, look, this Curriculum writing is a skill, and it's um, something that you develop over time, and it is not fully the same as teaching. And so that point of view made it a lot easier. Number, uh, number two, frankly, young people, particularly a lot of the young people we have in Baltimore City, those who migrate from school to school, right, for a variety of reasons that are very day-to-day, you know, very connected to day-to-day living needs. You know, we have young people who don't stay in the same school for, you know, five months, let alone five years. And so to have everyone, to having adults just doing what they think is right um, is unfair to kids. And that consistency that you just described, for me, means that there's greater opportunity uh, for the connection. The second piece is I realized very clearly, particularly during my work at EdTrust and looking at schools across the country, I found that one of the unintended consequences of focusing on literacy and math, and I think, you know, I came up during the NCLB era, and there was a lot that was good in terms of looking at equity um, and equity of outcomes. But what I realized and saw very clearly across the country is that larger numbers of classrooms with black and brown young people, with first-generation college goers with low-income students were almost stripped of all of the richness of content that, one, we know from science is that kind of sticky knowledge that allows you over a period of time to be able to make connections in knowledge, Um, and two, they were far less likely um, to be exposed to things that in my own daughter's lives, you know, I could supplement. I, I, I remember saying, what do you mean you haven't done the Revolutionary War? Well, we're going to go to the library and we're, gonna, we're actually going to study the Revolutionary War. And we're going <laughs> to study the role of women in Revolutionary War and African Americans. <laughs> and we went to, you know, we went down to D.C. and they read the Constitution. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and yeah. what I realized was that actually, and this is why, and you all know this, this is why I call it an equity issue is that you have teachers teaching in some of the most challenging circumstances with young people that have had the least access to this kind of enriching content and whose families are the least equipped to make up for what schools are not giving. And so we turned the purpose in, in kind of an attempt not to offend people. We turned the purpose of school into just being a place where people kind of dialogue and exchange. And that's not what it is, right? Not for young people. There, there is a content that we can debate, but there, there is a responsibility um, for schools to be able to do that. And so content-rich curriculum, standards-aligned curriculum, for me, very early became an equity issue um, and that we were overly dependent on families to make up for the content that for generations people had come to expect schools to be able to give. I think that you've talked about this in terms of educational redlining. Is that an accurate way to depict some of your previous speeches and, and voicing this um, like idea into motion? Yeah, no, a lot of it was, which is why I think I was able and very comfortable to be forthright about it um, and to be able to say, you know, to your earlier point, no, this is the way we're going to do this, right? This is the direction. Now, there are so many other points um, for creativity and expansion, uh, but when it comes to setting a common 
um, standards aligned, content rich curriculum, that shouldn't, that's not going to be debatable. And it is because of redlining. It is because who gets access, which students get access to which content, to which kinds of writing. Um, and frankly, being really honest about standards that are there, and oftentimes in, in, in an attempt, and that, that was supposed to be the beautiful piece about, you know, college and career ready standards was, you know, we were almost what, you know, somebody else calls like rubbing kids' backs as they were getting further and further away from access to the kind of learning that gives that creates opportunities and opportunities to access agency and power. And so by that, right, you know, I'm sitting there with a middle schooler who's telling me they want to go to law school, they want to be a lawyer, real, real example here in Baltimore, and they don't know anything about the Constitution, they don't know anything about the legal process, they are tripping over every other word, right, in a passage about um, the legislative process. The, the writing is three to four years behind with no grammatical structure, no punctuation, no capitalization. We think it's going to come just, you know, where's it going to come from the air? And I'm sitting there having this conversation with a 12-year-old, and I'm thinking to myself, we are stringing this kid along with a lie that none of this knowledge is required to access their dream, and it's unfair. It's absolutely unfair. And so it is about educational redlining to me. And, and that, that to me is, is part of what the standards um, focus was, was frankly the most powerful leverage to do is to say let's stop kidding kids about and, and frankly lying to them in some kind of cloud of, you know, well-intentioned, you know, frankly, debilitating practice. Like, I mean, and, you know, people kind of, you know, you guys are used to it now because you've heard me say it, but it's, you know, we are lying. We are lying when we say that grammatical structure does not matter when you, when, when you write and that people will not view your capacity and your thinking differently when you stumble over, right, you know, text yeah, written yeah. at a 10th grade level. It's a lie, and it's not fair, and it's our job as schools to be able to, do, to, to, be able to make sure that kids have what they need in that area. Yeah. yeah. Thank you I'm for that. Thank you that actually for, yeah. Um, so one thing with implementing wit and wisdom that I think, not from all teachers, but what we've heard from some teachers out there is that this is just too hard for their students. Yeah. Um, and I think there's an automatic desire if you're having that feeling to then just take it down, right? Like, let me give them an easier text or somehow I'm just going to make this easier for them so they can get it and feel successful. And yeah. um, Lori and I listened to your talk at Research Ed probably too many times <laughs> um, about this educational redlining and how even with, you know, this standard line curriculum in place, that that could still happen, <clears throat> you know, that you could still have teachers who take that and then still don't give students the what they really need. Could you talk to a little bit about that of like, you know, if you're seeing that happening, what your thoughts are on what, what we do if we think this is too hard for our students? Yeah. And you know what, what, what I love about the fact that you all picked that up and, and, you know, I apologize. You had to watch the research ed uh, video a couple times to see it, but, um, but it was, <laughs> But it was great prepping for that because it did force um, me to really reflect on what we were seeing in classrooms. And, you know, I've said to colleagues who are like, oh, Sonia, you know it's about more than curriculum. I've always said, of course it's about more than curriculum. But if you don't have solid, you know, curriculum, then you're not even starting at ground zero. You're, you're starting from a deficit. I think what you described mm -hmm. is – really for me indicates a couple of things. One, the fact that the teachers, particularly in a large, too large a number of Baltimore City school classrooms, are coming to their teaching um, and their introduction to rigorous um, quality curriculum with young people that are already two, three, and 
if you count middle school, sometimes four years behind. And that question about what do I do, right, how do I actually address young people, um, you know, where they are in terms of helping them to build their schools, um, excuse me, build their skills without, you know, totally watering down the power of a really strong and rigorous curriculum um, or set of curriculum materials, I should say, is, is one of the things that I think I push our team here most on. And, and some of it is we have, we, meaning we, those of us who are not in front of young people every day trying to do the teaching, have tried to give simplistic answers to what is actually very challenging. And I, so I think, one, we need to own that it, that it is going to take giving teach, a teacher who, um, so in Wit and Wisdom, seventh grade includes um, uh, some excerpts from Chaucer. Right, yeah. um, and so as a former English major who you know did Old English and Middle English, right, Chaucer in its natural state is challenging enough, right, for the modern mm-hmm. speaker. Um, but when you are sitting in a classroom with three, uh, you know, kids who are three years, four years below grade level, it's going to require a different kind of teacher collaboration and planning. And it's going to require kind of real answers. And I think some of that, which we're working on now, is in the school day, right? So where, where within a young person's trajectory do they get to build on some of the foundational skills, not in place of that primary content, but in addition to? And we, we feel like we have some models in various classrooms across the, uh, across the district that we really need to uplift and kind of what does that mean for changing schedules, for extra time, how we support young people. The other piece is we have to let teachers know it is okay for young people to experience some struggle within the course of the day. Your whole day should not be feeling like, you know, you are incapable. But if we, if we provide very deliberate opportunities for young people to engage rigorous texts. And we know from a lot of the research that people have cited, right, and we know, and you guys know these folks as much as I do, like folks like David Lieben, who you had on, and, you know, Shanahan and other folks, that if you take away and you you resort back to the low-level text for extended periods of time, Kids are never going to build the muscle. And it's like when I first started doing squats with my husband, like I had muscles hurting <laughs> that I didn't even know I had, right? And so, so, the, so the question becomes, one, how do we help teachers um, effectively help kids um, work those muscles with proven methods rather than having to figure it out on, on their own. And I think part of our struggle has been um, the ability to give teachers um, some guidelines, some guidance, some, and support directly in, in that area. We have avoided it, and I said this in the research ed talk, you know, we avoid it with pat answers a lot of times from people who aren't sure of what to do. And I think we've got to kind of begin unpeeling that and giving teachers real examples, real classrooms. What does it mean to spend more time on a more complex text, right, so that the next time young people engage a similarly level text, it might not take quite as long? And and how are you patient with the fact that, Um, Some of these experiences are going to take time um, and elbow grease to get functioning. And what are the systems within classrooms and the way that we teach that actually help to support that? We have not had that discussion in as direct or explicit a way as we need to in the district. And I think the answer lies in a lot of the folks that you guys follow on Twitter the way that I do, right? I mean, you go into Kier Butts' room. Um, and he has figured it out, man. Like, he has kids who are, you know, in his class who are four <laughs> years behind grade level, but he has figured out how to structure the experiences, the failures, and the successes of young people 
so that they're not totally broken and shattered in a corner, but that they are experiencing it as muscle development. And, yeah, sometimes when you're exercising, your muscles are a little sore. But if it's purposeful and directed, um, that, I think, helps. And we – that's the area – very forthrightly as a district um, that we're really pushing to get better at because we can't, you can't give teachers pat answers for that kind of thing, you know, like, right. oh, just go keep it rigorous. And, you know, they're going to look at you, shrug, and say, yeah, buddy, you come take over my class for a month and see how it goes with you. <laughs> exactly. Um, <so. laughs> Yeah, so that that's really what we're working on, and I think those answers are in a lot of um, the classrooms where we're seeing some of the biggest the biggest lift. We just have to be able to design learning experiences for teachers for them to share that knowledge. Does that answer yeah, your question? That actually, absolutely, um, and it reminds me of um, something we're working on in our improvement continuous improvement community that we have here in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, something they're working on is having high teacher expectations. And I think we often just like think if we say, you should have higher expectations of your students, <laughs> that that magically happens. Um, yes. But what they actually found was that it's, what matters the most is, that, is teacher efficacy, so that the teacher actually feels like they can get the student from where they are to this rigorous curriculum. Um, yeah. And I just had never like put the two together like that before, but it's exactly what you were just talking about. Great. So that teacher yeah. has to feel like they can do it, right? That they need to know that I can help this student get there. And that's where, like you said, like a key air, I say like he embodies that. Like, I can do this. I can help this yeah. student. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, no. You know what? When you, were, when you mentioned his name, I mean, I immediately smiled because I think really that he, his, his attitude just embodies that. And I think half of it is mindset. It's like when you're running a marathon, right? It's not all about your body, it's, it's really half of it is your mind. You know, do you believe and think that you can do it? And uh, that was a turning point for me when he shared that he had to shift his thinking around what he was expecting from his students. And once he did, yeah. his perspective yeah. changed and implementation changed. And I just love how honest he was about that. Well, and, and I think one of the things we have to be honest about as educators is we do not – reflect explicitly on our practice. We really don't. We will talk generally about the challenges, but we don't have space. I didn't when I was in the classroom to really talk about what went well with this lesson. Like I lost kids in this writing lesson. Where did I lose them? Right? How do I know mm -hmm. that? And I think the difference to your point, when you fundamentally believe that young people are capable of this level of work, it then really pushes you to say, okay, what do I need to do better in that continuous improvement-like mm -hmm. cycle in looking at every teacher move and saying, okay, my class went off at this point in the lesson. What did you yeah. do during that point that kept your kids with you, right? Like, and, and Kier, show yeah. me, like, what do you do? Or, and many others, and we could all name other teachers as well, yeah. but – I, I think that we have not, and when I say we, I mean even administrators and central administrators, we haven't prioritized the time for teachers to be able to do that. But fundamental to that is a belief that young people really are capable of high-level work, regardless of their language status, regardless of their race, regardless of, regardless of their family income or zip code. And if you don't start there, then I find you never really get to reflecting what do mm -hmm. I have to change about how I do my work because you will always resort back to, but they're from this zip code, so really it's not fully my fault. And really there's so many other things that explain away why this young person isn't hitting this standard. And what I like to say is they need to be getting 100% from me. Other things in life will, will come up. And, and this is part of why it's a civil rights issue for me, is that there are people who have gone through just as much trauma um, throughout the African-American community, but they still knew how to read, right? Like, like they still figured out how, yeah. you know what I'm saying, how to write. I mean, I remember taking my girls to the African-American History Museum for, I think, their second time, and I made them all read um, the excerpt from Phyllis Wheatley's poetry and Banneker's letter, right, the asserting to Jefferson, right, the humanity of African Americans. And I'm like, you don't think he went through trauma? 
Of course he went through something, <laughs> right? Yeah. But, yeah. you know, at some point, again, I think that's where the shift happens. You're, you're much less able to reflect on your own practice and what you need to do differently if you fundamentally don't believe that the young people really can be doing that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, <laughs> if you guys don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I just was, like, envisioning a mic drop. That's why I was silent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I okay, stopped because I, was, cause I was like, oh, God, am I just rambling on and on. But go ahead. No, yeah, she's so good. No, so good. <laughs> well, I just want to uh, – before – I don't want to um, just talk about the challenges of implementing this new curriculum – so I yeah. wanted to also ha- spend some time, um, I know you actually get in the schools quite a bit, and I wanted to, to hear from you about what have you been seeing the past two years in the positives about Wit and Wisdom? What have you seen going well, hearing from teachers, students, families? Um, yeah, what are yeah. some good things? Oh, my gosh. I, there's, there really are a lot. And, and I'm actually glad we started with the challenges just so that people know. You know, we're not (laughs) saying we're there yet. I'm not saying we're there yet, but my God, it is so heartening when I go into a class and, you know, I see, you know, uh, young people actually talking about uh, the founding documents of our country. When I see young people talking about, like, westward expansion um, and then linking that to their own experiences. Like kids like talking about stuff. And I put stuff in quotes to say like <laughs> kids, our kids are eating up this content uh, for everybody trying to say, oh, they can only, um, you know, see one side or, you know, their experience is so different. Like our kids, and, and you guys know this, I say all the time, like the windows and mirrors elements of the curriculum um, are so, so heartening. Um, and them being able to see authors and learn content that reflects them and their lives, but also making connection um, to others and to history and to science is so um, so exciting. So I remember um, hearing a parent, a mom at one of our schools in, you know, when I was there for a meeting and she said her third grader, I think that's when it's either maybe her second grade. I can't remember where the ocean unit, the in-depth ocean unit is. And she said, <laughs> is it third grade? I had, third. thank you. I love that third, is it third, you know, and she said, she's coming home and talking about the ocean and she has all these details she said that I don't even know. And like the (laughs) the excitement in that parent's voice and this person, you know, was not, uh, you know, what was what I would call like, you know, a typical, um, I guess there's no typical, but, you know, this was not a, you know, parent who had the time to leap from museum to museum every weekend. Mm -hmm. And, but, but her face lit up. And so like when parents come and see that, that's exciting. Um, I love seeing our young people producing, you know, more writing than some of them have done in in their entire school careers. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I will, I will pick up things and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is how much, you know, this is looking pretty good. And one teacher I'll never forget, said to me, she said, Dr. Dr. S., if you saw what my students used to produce, and this was a fourth grade teacher, she said, we, to get through one good paragraph um, was a major accomplishment. Um, she said, now, like, they can't stop writing, and they, they write all the time. I will tell you, as a mother, um, the fact they have stuff that to write you know, about now. <laughs> oh my God, they, have, they actually have stuff to write about, you know. And my, kids, you know, even like my twins are coming home and and saying, well, wait, what's this about the electoral process, and how does that link that, and you know, World War II, and diff- and they are, they're also excited. So both as a mother, um, hearing other parents and family members, and from the young people themselves. And to your earlier point, I can't remember whether it was you, Lori, or you, Melissa, who made it. Um, our kids, by and large, are showing that they can, they can tackle this stuff. And it's, it's very heartening. Teachers being able to have conversations across schools um, with the same curriculum is 
is wonderful, right? Mm-hmm. They, they actually yeah. can go yeah. across town and see someone else doing um, a similar lesson. Um, they can share plans, and the plans are actually related and grounded in a common experience. It, it's changed the t- kind of conversations we're having and, and the experiences kids are having, and that, that is really heartening. It really is. Mm-hmm. I will never forget. I was in a seventh grade classroom, and I can't uh-huh. remember why they were. T- it was it was actually with um, they were doing the Shake the Chaucer, um, Canterbury Tales, and for some reason yeah. the fall of the Roman Empire came up with that. I can't I don't remember the connection or why it came up, <laughs> but the students were so interested in it and wanted to talk about it so badly. And the teacher, you could see it in her face. She didn't want to kind of derail the lesson by talking about it. So her her struggle was like, do I let them talk about this? content <laughs> um, that doesn't really matter for this lesson. Um, but I was like, what a great struggle to have, right? That that is your struggle right now is that they actually want to talk about the content of what is in this curriculum. Um, and they're just interested. And these are seventh graders that, are, that want to talk about this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then like making the connections, um, you know, to to texts that also reflect their experience. And one of the things I appreciate about Wit and Wisdom um, is the diversity of the authors um, and the texts that kids are reading. Um, so, so they are reading um, about the African American experience and the um, Latino perspective, and that that for me is important um, because it is about windows and mirrors. And no, it's not perfect, and it's not going to have everything but it's so much richer than what we had before. And yeah, it's very exciting. It really is. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you hundred percent. I know that Lori talks all the time about how she is not happy that her own daughter does not have this curriculum. I know. I'm obsessed with it. So we'll need need to send this podcast directly to that school system. (laughs) Well, now, you know, I'm going to a, a tight lips for me. Um, I'm good. <laughs> I know. Well, because I just get so excited in terms of seeing and hearing what the kids in Baltimore City are like engaging with. Like, I love being in classrooms and seeing the kids' faces and hearing those conversations. And you know, I stopped a kid in the hallway, um, and I I was talking to him about what his favorite part so far this year of Wit and Wisdom was, and he shared a text that was like from module one and we were in the very end of the school year. So for him to pull that back in his memory and, and then be able to tell me why, and he was making connections to other texts and how it came back, you know, throughout the year. And it's just exciting to hear them talk about it. Whereas I don't hear that from my own little one who she's definitely coming home and sharing more skills, you know, that she's learning. So then as a parent, I feel the need to, as a parent who's in education, I feel the need to take her to the library and get like tech sets on yeah, different topics yeah. because I want to expand her knowledge. I want her to know all about the things that all of the other kids get to know about. So, um, yeah. you know, it's just exciting to think about it from an educator point of view, but sad personally as a mom, but I know we'll get there one day. I, I feel confident. <laughs> that we will. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So. Yep. Yep. Well, yep. we always like to end the podcast, Dr. S, with asking for a piece of advice um, to, for, for the, whoever is our guest to share a piece of advice with our listeners. And we have a wide variety of listeners. We have teachers. We have school leaders. We have district leaders. Um, my dad listens because he doesn't know anything oh, about it. Oh, hello, dad. <laughs> you have a fabulous daughter. <laughs> she, she's reading the knowledge gap to try to learn what I do every day. He's like, I don't understand. I'm like, read the book. Um, so thinking about our listener base, um, what, is there any piece of advice that you would give in terms of folks who are considering implementing high quality curriculum, folks who are already implementing, um, people who may not even know what it is. Like we, we run the gamut. So, Feel free to leave a piece of advice. So I think one of the things that I'm most proud of, and I think one of the things that worked well in our adoption that I would, you know, give as a reflection point slash advice, um, and that would be to really think through 
the rationale for why this shift to content and to higher level um, college and career aligned um, curriculum. Like I, I think that oftentimes part of why it falls flat and people ignore it is because folks don't know the rationale behind it. And one of the things for me, and again, I fortunately, based on my background and experience, could case make because, as you saw earlier, I do have, you know, I've, I've developed a series of belief points that are, um, you know, grounded in the research. And so I think that, so that's number one, is I would not shy away from the importance of case making and allowing kind of job alike groups or constituencies to case make to one another. Like parents can case make far better <laughs> for this kind of shift than any educator can. Um, teachers make the case. You know, when I tell people, you know, look, don't listen to me, you know, go, you know, go sit in Kier's classroom if you don't believe me. Um, I think that same thing with superintendents. So I don't ne neglect the case making. And then another piece is don't, uh, is do yourself a favor, whoever you are, and really immerse yourself in in a lot of the clarity around the reading science and the writing science and how kids learn. Um, I have yet to meet a teacher who, when confronted with what we know, what has been reaffirmed, and what is clear about early reading in K2 and the, the need for um, all of the different components, be it phonics or phonemic awareness or vocabulary development, who don't say that their everyday teaching is better because of it. Don't do it just because, you know, you like the way that the three of us sound on a podcast. Do, do the work <laughs> yourself. Do, do the lift yourself. And that, that's what I have heard from so many teachers, particularly our early K2 teachers who are going through some of the letters training and early literacy. You know, they look and they're like, if I had known if I had just yeah. known, if somebody had told me these are not bad people, these are not folks out to sabotage kids, um, but, you know, so, so do yourself a favor and, and acquaint yourself with the research so that you're not just quoting us. You're doing it because of the, of the, the dig that you've done. And that's, that's why Emily Hanford's work was so well received. She was not a trained educator. She, she did the digging on her own. Um, and, right. you know some circle she's been vilified for it, but you know, that always comes when you reveal truth. And so that, that would, those would be my two pieces of advice if I had to give any. Right. Well, well our next, um, our next uh, person on our podcast is Emily Hanford. So that was a good <laughs> see up for <laughs> See, and you did not That's even tell me that. that. <laughs> too. I no. know. <laughs> well, well, when she comes on, and I have, I have met, I've had the pleasure of meeting Emily, um, but, but I do think she did educators an incredible, incredible service. There are things I don't have to say anymore because Emily Hanford says them. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, I, I think a lot of it is because she's a journalist and she knows how to write for everyday people, um, to be able to hear it. And, you know, I think the next stage is, um, group and what's really heartening is, you know, groups of parents that I know, um, in Tennessee and in Oakland, and these are parents of color. These are African-American women, uh, you know, Vizia in, in Tennessee. And I met, oh, I wish I could remember her name. Um, I think it's Oakland parents. Now these are parents that, families that are taking the reading research and making an informed demand on schools and systems. And, and, if, and if we are honest about it as education leaders and systems leaders, that actually should make our work easier. It really should mm -hmm. because that, then the case making is done. So you didn't ask for that piece, but I slipped it in at the end anyway. <laughs> That's great. Well, yeah. we cannot thank you enough for being on our podcast today. This was amazing, and hopefully we'll have you on again sometime soon. Oh, please. Well, and I hope everybody stays well, and I just want to thank you all. You, two, you guys represent Baltimore City, Baltimore City educators, um, students, and just our city, period, incredibly well. Um, your love for our young people. Um, your commitment to their success is really evident in how you go about the work. So I thank you for that, really.
Oh, we appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. We can say the same thing about you for sure. <laughs> I know. Fair enough. Fair. No. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Have a great one. You, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>